I stress. I have horrible stress. You know, high school is brutal. High school is tough for a lot of kids. Peer pressure, drugs, alcohol. I think there's more competition nowadays to go to, like, the best college, to make the best SAT score since, like, everybody's trying to be the best. I actually do worry a lot about violence. I have a lot of friends that are worried about terrorism and violence. Most of my friends are on either an anti-anxiety or an antidepressant medication. Stress can come from anywhere. School, parents, friends, sports, world events, even from ourselves. It's just craziness. It's insanity. Um, it's like you're never happy with what you've achieved. There's always more. There's a lot more that are put on our kids' plates that they have to figure out where, you know, how does that fit in their lives. There's things that they worry about that I'm, I didn't have to worry about. School shooting, school violence, you know, the, the economy. All of these problems and pressures aren't going to go away. The question is, how do we deal with them? What can we do to keep our stress under control? I don't know if I was, quote, like, suicidal, but I was not in a good space. Your pressure. If you don't fit in, you're not cool. It's all about trying to impress your friends. All my friends had it, and that's what I had to have to, um, so we could all be part of this wonderful unified clique. There were always constantly people telling me, "Come on, just try it. You know, the one time, it'll be fine." That's why peer pressure is really big on some kids. They really need to feel like what they're doing is right, because they don't, they can't make the decision for themselves. It's like if you're going to do your own thing and if you're going to do something different than anybody and better than anybody, then you're going to get ridiculed. Ridiculed if you don't fit in, if you don't have the right clothes, the right friends, act the right way. The social pressure for teenagers can be intense, and inevitably, there will be a time when you don't fit in, when you're excluded from a group. I think everyone's, like, excluded just a little bit. It kind of makes me feel like I'm not that great of a person or something. Going to high school and stuff, I mean, you're, you would always be excluded from certain groups you would want to be in, but, um, I mean, I think that's necessary because later on, you know how to deal with that, you know how to deal with that exclusion. Taylor is trying to avoid the problem altogether. His friends and teammates know him as a popular two-sport athlete. What they don't know is that he gets good grades and studies three hours a night. He's afraid some people would call him a geek if they knew. You don't go and brag how much you studied or things like that. That's not exactly the cool thing. I think there's that, that bias that if you're too smart or too accomplished in an academic sense, you are lacking other skills to make up for it, that you don't have the social skills. Taylor knows that's not true, but still he doesn't want to be labeled as a geek. So he keeps his studying quiet. But he knows that giving in to the pressure and not studying at all would be much worse. It shouldn't be the uncool thing to study because uh, in the long run, that's it matters to get good grades and end up in a good college and further your education. And the kids who study now? Usually they end up unpopular, but that's okay because they're going to get a good ed education. And, and they'll be the people, they'll be the people um, giving <laughs> jobs to the people who aren't studying. <laughs> but when we feel unpopular, when we're being left out of the crowd, it's hurtful, stressful, and it's hard to know how to deal with it. But these kids have some advice. As far as being excluded goes, I know that you find things you enjoy and you do the things you like. It's not hard to, to find yourself a group to be a part of. As I try to do my own thing and go my own way and hang with people that are similar to me. It's helpful for children to develop a sense of resilience about the fact that not everybody's going to like them. And that's okay because they don't like everybody either. <laughs> I wrote this song actually. Sarah used to worry about people not liking her. I was very self-conscious because I was made fun of 
earlier on and really rejected by this couple group of girls that I wanted to be friends with so badly that I just would I just thought I'd do everything. I'd invite them over to sleepovers and stuff like that. And I was just trying so hard. And nothing worked. But when she got older, she realized that trying to fit in didn't win any friends. Being herself did. She's always herself. I've never seen her in a situation where she acts a certain way or likes a specific thing just so she can fit in. I feel you know, different. I feel like I stand out and that gives me a confident side because it's like letting people know that this is who I am and I'm not afraid to be who I am. Or I don't even think she thinks about the way she dresses. She just likes to have fun. But as I'm getting older, I'm starting to realize that what other th people think about me just doesn't matter as much anymore. And I think that's one of the reasons why I just am able to let go and let myself dress the way I want to dress or do funky things with my hair or my makeup and just be myself. You do well in middle school, so you get into the honors class in high school, and you do well in high school, so you get into the best college, and, and so on and so on. Everybody's gotten to be so competitive, and we have to get into the right college with the right name and the right, you know, grades and the right honor societies, and it's ridiculous. It may be ridiculous, but the pressure to perform in school is unavoidable, especially when it comes to college entrance exams, the SAT, the ACT. The result is more and more anxiety among high school students. Students like John Doley. That morning, I just, my hands were sweating, I was nervous, I just wanted to get it done. The first time John took the ACT, he scored a 26. I was hoping to get, uh, you know, upwards of a 28 when I first took it. And, and at first, when I got 26, you know, I thought that's a reachable goal. So he went to work, bought an ACT study guide, and signed up for prep classes like this one. Remember the goal is to, to answer the questions and move on. Most experts say it's difficult to raise an ACT score by more than a point or two. Even so, John took the test five times, hoping to get a 28. John has taken this so seriously at times that you just... It's, it becomes the thing that he wakes up and talks about when he wakes up in the morning. It's the thing that he talks about that evening. Um, and then and then sometimes he doesn't talk and those are the times which are really kind of scary because you know that he's thinking about it and he would like to do better and almost every student who hopes to go to college is competing to get the best test score the best grades to have the best resume you're competing with thousands of students nationwide the process is so nerve-wracking because you never know what's gonna happen uh, and you're just always looking for that extra edge but there are a few ways to cut down on the stress, especially before a big test. First, make sure you don't get behind in your studying. Cramming at the last minute is stressful and usually ineffective. Then, right before the test... Get a good night's rest, eat a balanced meal, come to school uh, dressed comfortably, uh, try to keep peace at home. Uh, don't make a quarrel with your parents the night before a major test. Don't break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Try to save that for the weekend. And during the test, if you blank or start to stress out... I would suggest a kid get up, go get a drink of water in the hall, or let, tell the teacher, I'm, I'm freaking out. I am completely drawing a blank. I've got to walk around. Can I pace outside the door? Physically remove yourself from the situation and take some slow, deep breaths. Because the more they stare at that test paper, the more helpless they're going to feel. All that will help with tests. But the stress of school isn't just in the classroom. Megan felt that stress. She comes from an active, successful family. And she felt driven to be involved in lots of activities and to be the best at all of them. She liked the recognition she got from being good at sports, getting good grades, being on student council. So she studied constantly and kept her schedule filled with activities. And it's like, 
it's like there's always more to be done. There's always m more things you can be better at, more things you can put on your resume. She pushed herself, competed in every aspect of her life. So when her mom and sister went on a diet, she did too. Megan lost a lot of weight quickly and developed an eating disorder. In her mind, if thinner was better, she was going to be the best. The only way I knew if I looked okay was to like compare myself. So for example, if someone said, oh, she's cute, okay, do I look like her? Am I just as thin as her? Competition can be incredibly damaging at, at times like this when it becomes the only value. Pediatrician Dr. Kenneth Haller has seen the toll competition can take on kids. In fact, what, what often happens is that uh, kids will become involved in, in things to anesthetize themselves, whether it's through alcohol or drugs. Um, and frankly, a lot of eating disorders seem to be related to these sorts of anxieties. Within two years, Megan had lost more than 30 pounds. It got dangerous in the fact that I was hopeless. And I don't know, I don't know if I was, quote, like, suicidal, but I was not in a good space. Unable to handle her problems alone, Megan got help. First therapy, and later an eating disorders clinic, where she spent the last half of her senior year. Bonding with the class, the last hurrah, and I missed it. Missed the senior prom that I planned. Megan needed professional help to get her life back under control. She was dealing with some very complicated issues, and one of them was something a lot of us deal with every day. So much to do, so little time. It's fun to be involved, be on the team, in the play, but getting it all done without stressing out takes some planning and organization. We really use um, planners or agendas or even palm pilots, but some organizational scheme for effectively managing all the things they need. And if that's not enough, if we're overwhelmed by it all, not sleeping or eating because we're too busy, it may be time to let something go. Kids don't often have the number of hours in a day to do what they need to do. So we can certainly help by looking at scheduling and cutting out things that aren't necessarily very essential. Megan has learned to cut out non-essential activities and stress, but it's taken years of therapy. She has recovered from her eating disorder and has realized that who she is isn't based on how she looks, what grades she gets, or how many achievements she earns. If you know what you are and who you are without looking outside of you, that solves a lot right there. September 11th, 2001. It was just, it was really terrifying to think that, you know, this could be happening to the U.S., which, you know, in my mind before, the U.S. just seemed so safe. I definitely got the message that things can happen to us and things apparently will happen to us here, and that really frightened me. War, terrorist attacks, code reds. A few years ago, they seemed so far away, but not anymore. The draft, I don't want that to happen. The reality of what's going on in the world, they can't escape from. And so it's hard to play and be carefree and things like that when you're worried about your own safety and when it has hit your own country. Like, I always thought that we were like a special country, you know, and all that stuff, because you hear about how great America is, and I felt so safe here. Wars kept coming up in my head, like World War III. It was just, it was really terrifying. But however frightening these possibilities are, Remember, the chances that something will happen near your home is pretty small. Even with 9-11, you can say, you know, world terrorism is, is horrible and we do have to worry about it. But when you think about it, you know, that doesn't happen very often. And everyone's doing everything they can to keep us safe. And there are things we can do to bring down our stress level. We do know in general that when people feel stress, the more control they have over the situation, the better they do. Um, so during um, 
wartime, we try to get kids real involved. For example, if they have a parent that's overseas, in having their school write letters or having them, you know, make care packages. Those are all things that can help. I mean, there are a lot of things you can try to get kids to be more aware of that will give them a little sense of power. Being active is a way to handle a stressful situation, and so is expressing how you feel. I try to write what I'm feeling, what I'm afraid of, and just expressing my feelings of, you know, why did this happen? I'm angry that this happened. Is it going to happen again? Just saying that to my parents, I guess. Even though I'm almost an adult, I really needed them. Silence is not the answer. Silence doesn't mean that it's going to make the fear go away. You know, anything could happen at any time. We don't know, we don't know the set date or time. And I think that's everybody's biggest fear, flat out, about terrorism and about violence, is that anything can jump off at any given time, you know? Just, just that in itself, fear of the unknown. Growing up, Mary had her own way of dealing with stress. She ignored it. She never told anyone about her problems. When she was in seventh grade, she struggled with self-doubt and anxiety. I just felt awful. I felt like I wasn't pretty enough and that I was too skinny or, you know, just all those thoughts that girls have running through their head but ten times worse. I mean, things were just spinning around in my head. I had no idea what was going on. Um, I was real tired all the time, but like I kept on, I kept going, you know, and I just kept it down inside. I wouldn't tell anybody what was going on with me. Um, I was just like, I'm fine. I'm just, you know, imagining things. Kathy Boyd, the director of Mary's school, says that Mary kept all of her pain to herself. She would put on that happy face and she put pressure on herself that she couldn't let anybody know how lonely or how sad or how anxious or angry or confused she was. In a way, Mary was even hiding from herself. In order to escape, she began drinking. Her grades dropped and she started sleeping more, a lot more. And I could sleep for 24 hours without any problem. Common signs of teen anxiety and depression. Signs that everyone missed. And things only became worse her sophomore year. While on a date, Mary's boyfriend raped her. Unable to hide or escape from the pain, the wall she had hidden behind for so long came crashing down. Mary had what she calls a meltdown. And my mom just got so scared. I was in my room kicking and screaming and just bawling my eyes out. When she started crying and you know, telling me she couldn't help what was happening to her and that she didn't have control of it. And, you know, it was a surprise. Mary was diagnosed with depression and was admitted to a hospital psychiatric unit. She says it saved her life. She only wishes she'd found help sooner. Now that I look back, it wasn't worth it. I should have just told my parents, you know, somebody that I trusted and gotten help. Mary still battles anxiety and depression. Daily antidepressant medication and therapy have helped. So has her work in art class. It kind of puts my pain and emotion into not exactly words, but it explains it. And I feel it makes me feel great when people understand what I'm talking about. She has grown you know, so much in the year, year and a half she's been here. When I wake up, I can't really, I don't know, it's just. It's questionable how I'm going to be, like, if I'm going to be kind of down or just, like, moody or anxious or real quiet. And, I don't know. Or happy. It's just, I don't know. I surprise myself every day. But she knows now that having the courage to talk to someone about your anxiety, the pressure you feel, helps. They need a venue to be able to talk where they feel like someone listens and validates. And that can make the beginning difference for someone who's suffering from anxiety or depression to get the help they need. It is estimated that one in eight adolescents will experience depression. If the stress starts to overload the defense mechanisms, you're going to get depression. And that can take the form of being 
uh, unable to sleep, having difficulty concentrating, memory gets a little worse, you get tired, you lose interest in things, you start to feel down, and then all of a sudden you're behind in your classes. Now you've got to hurry up, more anxiety piles on. Depression and anxiety are serious medical issues requiring professional treatment. Therapy sessions provide an emotional outlet, and medication, if necessary, creates a chemical safety net, helping to balance out your emotions. Antidepressants work about 80% of the time, which is pretty good. And uh, often, if one antidepressant doesn't work, another one does. These girls know how helpful medication can be for depression and anxiety. I'm taking it because um, last summer I started having anxiety issues. It was kind of like a reality check, like, hey, listen, you know, you're not as strong as you think you are, and this can happen to you, and you're just going to have to break down and realize that this is what's going to get you out of it. And it did, and I'm thankful for that. But you can't get the medication or therapy without asking for help. Rachel learned long ago that she couldn't fight her problems without help and she's facing what could be the most intense anxiety imaginable, a terminal disease. I am the only person with my type of cancer who relapsed after a bone marrow transplant and did not die within weeks. Rachel was diagnosed with a rare cancer when she was in 10th grade. Since then, she's been in treatment and she's watched fellow patients, friends, die. She just passed away recently. Rachel has been in remission before, but the cancer came back. Doctors aren't sure what else they can do. So, every day for the last six years, she's had to wonder when she was going to die. It was hard. It made me think about, you know, my own life and when I went to funerals, wondering, you know, if my funeral would be soon. So how does she deal with all those thoughts? I think a really healthy and helpful way is to not try to push it down inside of you, but to try to, you know, let it out and deal with it. And that way, it's a lot easier than it just growing inside of you and trying to take over. So she's found ways to express herself and get her feelings out, so the fear and anxiety don't consume her. I have a lot of different ways I've learned to cope and do things with, with the pain. I do a lot of artwork, and I write poetry, I write in a journal, listen to music, talk to my friends, volunteer with different charities, anything to be, you know, helping others and helping myself and just getting stuff out, not letting it eat me up inside. like you're not alone and that those thoughts can come out somehow that they don't have to live inside you and keep bothering you and making you feel down that there's a way to cope with it even with death and she says you just might surprise yourself with how strong you are and how much you can handle I remember thinking, you know, if I ever got sick again, I don't think I could handle it. But here I am, and I'm still positive. I'm still going strong. I don't really know where it comes from, but I'm happy that it does come. <laughs>